Loki's music has become the anthem of the anti-war movement, but especially of that for the freedom of Palestine. His lyrics, which calls for globalizing the Intifada, have become a thorn in the Israel lobby's back. Somewhere, there was a child looking up at the sky. A contraption built with one aim. The taking of life. Most musicians, if they have a trilogy, they'll release it within a five-year period of time. And that it will be used to kill him one day. Quite a lot has changed, but also quite a lot has remained the same. As once said, the role of an artist is to make you respect the moment a baby is born, above all. You tackle subjects like the genocide in Gaza. This is a message to the sour and the powerful Our crew will never bow down to you like cowards do All we know, reach towards the sun like the flowers do When they snatch his life, I wonder the truth Malcolm knew You care about celebrities and every time they bow well, Your you album is a light right now like in the midst of these, this horrific genocide will tell you the truth about our views For children of the camps searching for electricity Constantly waiting for a destiny that they didn't see I know I can't change the world with the next simile But I can paint a vivid picture of the next victory the soul lives on even when you're dead physically I wrote this song to lyrically in the trilogy it won't be long let me spell it explicitly my voice will not die even if they imprison me I said that I was been in the making well Loki is the most significant artist to emerge from the street in the United Kingdom not just a hip hop artist not just a broadcaster but a man I call the philosopher king. Like me, he ain't no academic bruv. But when you hear him speak, he should be at the United Nations. He should be in parliament on the front bench. This is a man of towering intellect, integrity and eloquence. What's up everyone? This is Manar Adli. I'm the founder and director of Mint Press News and welcome to our Mintcast podcast. This is the official podcast of Mint Press News. And as you may know, this show and all of our podcasts are supported by our members on Patreon. So we hope that you can join us today. From personal attacks and smears to letter writing campaigns, Israel spends a huge amount of time and resources trying to silence its critics all over the world. But one person they have failed to do so is rap legend and host of The Watchdog here at Mint Press, Low Key. Low Key's music has become the anthem of the anti-war movement, but especially of that for the freedom of Palestine. His lyrics, which calls for globalizing the Intifada, have become a thorn in the Israel lobby's back, who have attempted to equate that line with anti-Semitism. Now, the Israel lobby has gone so far as to not only blacklist Loki, but to try to get his music off of Spotify. But their attempts to silence him have only backfired. Loki joins me today to discuss his new album, Soundtrack to the Struggle 3, the Israel lobby's attempts to cancel him for his activism, and Israel's latest spying tools that he has helped lead investigations into for us here at Mint Press News. Loki, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. And really, this album, it couldn't have happened uh, without uh, Mint Press and also the help from Mint Press in stopping the campaign to remove my music from Spotify was absolutely vital at the time. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Well, we appreciate your work for Palestine. And of course, we stand by you all the way. Um, Loki, your latest album, Soundtrack to the Struggle 3, is out next week on October 28th on all major streaming platforms. This is very exciting news considering all of the attacks and blacklisting and attempts to get you off of Spotify by the Israel lobby, as you mentioned. In it, you tackle subjects like the genocide in Gaza, the imprisonment of Julian Assange, the failed two-party system here in the U.S., the double-edged uh, nature of modern technology. And, um, you know, your album is a light right now, I think, uh, in the midst of these this horrific genocide. Um, can you tell us a bit more about it and how did it come to pass? 
So really, the album is the final uh, step in the trilogy soundtrack to The Struggle, which essentially came out of um, uh, an aspiration to try and crystallize some of the popular feeling within the streets throughout these War on Terror generations. Growing up, I was a part of the anti-war movement and I wanted to try and turn some of that the slogans that would be used on the demonstrations, the chants that would be used on the demonstrations into something that could be repeated, that had melody to it, that was able to express a lot of that yearning for social justice and a better world. And so Soundtrack to the Struggle 1 was released in 2011, and I was very fortunate in that at that time, the structure of the internet allowed us to sell a lot of copies of it um, as downloads uh, through iTunes. And what that led to was the album actually charting. And at that time, it was very rare, not only for rappers, but unsigned independent rappers to chart in this country, and especially with the content that we had on there, songs like Obama Nation, songs like Terrorists, songs like Long Live Palestine, all of them were on that uh, first soundtrack to the struggle. And so in a way, we were able to make those songs echo throughout the years. Um, and I've been very lucky because that album has continued to be listened to by people. And in some ways, I think maybe in the last year, more people have listened to the songs on that album, like Hand On Your Gun, like Long Live Palestine, than they did at the time when it was released, seemingly. Um, and uh, that has been an amazing, an amazing thing. Then Soundtrack to the Struggle 2 was released in 2019, um, following quite a long hiatus from releasing music, but I was still active and was still making music and was still touring. Um, and now it's time for Soundtrack to the Struggle 3, which I was intending to uh, uh, produce earlier, but, you know, because of the... Uh, circumstances of work and you know the 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 structure of the job of being a rapper changed across these years when i look at the three albums i see three different models of making music and making a living from making music whereas the first model we didn't really have much of the touring infrastructure that was in place by the time we got to 2019 but then obviously um, so, th so that meant we did tour in 2011, but it was a smaller tour um, and it was one that was structured in such a way that was a bit more ad hoc. And then when we got to 2019, we were in a position where I was able to do quite a big tour with the album and travel. And the best thing I find about touring is you do meet and greets after the show, you get to come face to face with people that have formed some form of relationship with you through the music. And they talk to you about the music and what it's meant to them. And that's just been an amazing and wonderful experience um, that I've really appreciated. Um, and of course, with the second album, you had songs like Ghosts of Grenfell, which was of course extremely close to me because of my proximity to the tower on the night and seeing the, the fire on the night and losing one of my friends in the fire. Um, a song like Ahmed dealing with the refugee crisis. Um, and uh, so that album, we had Noam Chomsky featuring on the album. That album, again, was sort of a snapshot of time. And in a way, I feel like these three Soundtrack to the Struggles al albums, each of them offer a different part of history. And I hope it's my wish that, you know, when these songs will live longer than I will, that people will be able to learn a little bit about the historical moment of when the songs were made um, after we're all gone. Um, people will be able to study these songs and say, ah, so this was happening at the time and this was happening at the time. Unfortunately, with a lot of the music that is produced these days, it sort of exists in quite an, um, a performed apolitical sphere, which 
kind of renders invisible a lot of the dynamics of the society at the time and the antagonisms at work. Whereas each of these albums, you will be able to listen to them and tell a little bit about what was going on at the time. And so then this this third album, Soundtrack to the Struggle 3, um, has obviously been written in the shadow of genocide in Gaza, but also the looming regional war, which is essentially about reconfiguring the uh, the the area and achieving cultural change in a way that the Zionist project wants and will find advantageous. So it's a very pregnant time with uh, a lot of um, a lot of tomorrows um, within it. And the question is, where will we go? You know, it's a pivotal moment, really, in human history, actually. And so I hope that some of that is captured uh, by this album. And then, as you alluded to in your question also, the the development of technology to such a point when we are simultaneously constantly watching, but also constantly being watched and listened to by these devices that we carry with us. And that has all types of implications. You know, if you look at when Soundtrack for the Struggle 1 was released, people were downloading the MP3 via iTunes. So it was being downloaded directly onto their computers. Now, in 2024, you're in a situation where the companies that are the streaming companies are also data mining companies. So there's actually a two-way exchange. It's not a simple transaction. It means that when people are listening to my music, the company which is streaming the songs is also uh, deducing information about the listener and then that information is then monetized to more effectively advertise to the listener that's at very least that's what we know about the information that's being gleaned so the whole nature of music buying and selling has changed when i was 17 and going to open mics with my friends and pressing up cds at home rapping at the open mics and then selling the cds after the open mic that was the shape of some form of an industry it was a simple transaction whereby you're getting the cd and selling it to someone that's where it ends but then you have the itunes era then you have the and you have that is also in lock and step with the facebook and the youtube era and as you know from the way these media platforms have developed more and more has been taken from the user but in a way that the user may not be completely aware of um, and and that issue of data, I think, is actually central to that album in some way. And it, I, on a particular track, I do touch on it. But um, it's really fascinating the way that across these three albums, which span basically 15 years, which is kind of crazy. Most musicians, if they have a trilogy, they'll release it within a five year period of time, whereas this is like 15 years. So there's quite a lot has changed but also quite a lot has remained the same and so i think it would be interesting for people to to kind of uh, see some of that development he is certainly one of the most demonized human beings of our time he has been rendered among the unpeople in a way his willingness to take up and defend those who have been dehumanized on an industrial scale he became one of them. Imagine a world where criminals are worshipped And it's the innocent, they're filling up the earth with Those that expose them in literal internment Judges working with murderers are giving them the verdict If Blair was in jail, there in a cell Punished for his war crimes, would he be wearing it well? Instead he's on the news without a care in the world Pontificating about ideas he can sell What if your crimes were reflected on your face? Would they waste time? And I'm glad you touched on that because I think surveillance capitalism in general is probably the most important issue um, that we're facing in terms of um, data collection and using that data against us. So um, if the and, and by the way, that is all intertwined with Israel and the genocide and Israel's surveillance tech industry, which you touch on in um, your music and also have helped us lead investigations on those issues um, at Mint Press. So, but to go take a step back a little bit, um, you know, if, if it were up to the Israel lobby, this new album would never have even been made. You faced constant attacks from Israel supporters, 
because of the content of your songs. More than a decade ago, the Jewish Chronicle newspaper called your popularity a nightmare for the state of Israel. Um, could you tell us about some of the attacks you faced and more specifically about um, where the Israel lobby is now in the UK in their attacks against you and your music? Wow. Well, of course, across these years, the power of the lobby in this country has increased massively um, at the point in 2011. The, the phrase globalized the Intifada, um, speaking about Zionism, it they didn't like it and they would publish on small blogs information about it. They would send people to events to write blogs about it, to record what was being said. However, they didn't seemingly at that time have the power to do things like shut bank accounts, like get you, you no know, platformed. Um, they didn't successfully chase people out of their jobs, though there were some cases of people losing their jobs um, with charities more particularly. Um, but, you know, the political parties had a far wider uh, space and larger parameters for political expression around Israel and Zionism at that time. There were several really clear political figures. So when Soundtrack to the Struggle 1 came out, um, George Galloway may have still been in Parliament at that time. Um, I participated in the Viva Palestina convoy to Gaza in 2009 with him. Um, so you had a, a different shape, really. <clears throat> and the lobby, it had nothing like the role in public life that it now has off the back of the Corbyn years. And I deal with some of that in The Killing of Corbynism, which is about a political project which I was personally, um, emotionally invested in um, and worked to um, empower in any way that I could. I knocked door to door in my community, asking people to vote for the Labour Party, I intervened directly in both the 2016 and the 2019 election with everything I could. And it actually led to, in our area, which while uh, the particular area, Latimer Road, which is around uh, Grenfell, is one of the most densely populated um, places in the country. It's one of the poorest wards in the country. It's a part of a constituency, which is the richest constituency in the country. Um, so you have a 20 year difference in life expectancy between those that live in the part of the borough, um, Latimer Road, um, where I'm from, and the part of the borough that, say, the Israeli embassy is in, because the Israeli embassy is in South Kensington, Latimer Road is in North Kensington. And so for us to be able to get a pro Corbyn Labour candidate into Parliament in 2016 was a significant achievement. Because um, the, the, the constituency always voted conservative. And so as part of that Corbyn project, we were doing everything we could to push it as far um, as possible. However, the Israel lobby over the next years was able to really hammer down um, and confect crisis after crisis on the basis of expression around Israel and Palestine. And so what it led to was Corbyn almost being weaponized against the membership that he'd brought in. Because with Jeremy Corbyn um, becoming the leader of the Labour Party, you had the party grow to about 600,000 members. Now that rendered it the largest political party in Western Europe. However, what wow. happened was, bit by bit, they were kicking people out of the party on trumped up charges of uh, anti-Semitism, but essentially it was for being pro-Palestinian. Um, and so you had thousands of people kicked out of the party, many more thousands of people leave the party because of that situation, and eventually Corbyn himself was kicked out of the party, despite the fact that for so many years he had been basically turning a blind eye to what the Israel lobby was doing in the party. Um, and so that's dealt with on the song, The Killing of Corbynism, basically a lesson in the intransigence of the British political system, the undemocracy of the British political system. Um, and so um, 
really that was that was part of this period of time. Um, of course, you then have the other things that happened across uh, the period leading up to this album, which have all gone into and informed um, this uh, this uh, this work. And and really, there was more of an optimism to some extent, at least prior to Grenfell for me, because Grenfell was only one week after Corbyn had almost won the election. Um, we literally were 2,000 votes away from winning the election. Um, and in the case of the Corbyn, the pro-Corbyn politician that won in my locality, that was somebody who literally won by about 50 votes. So in a way, I guess my music slash career could be a case study in the uh, relationship between music and political involvement and a musician as a political actor. So trying to achieve political objectives and music being some form of tool in that in that process. And since one of your primary focuses in the new album is of course Israel and you've you know you've seen the way so, sorry I should actually I should actually more um more in a more detailed way respond to your question because I think I became, I, I got to a little bit of a tangent about Corbyn specifically. Yeah, but so okay. the build the build yeah. up of the lobby meant then that by 2022, where the Jewish Chronicle, which has now been found to have laundered fake news for Netanyahu's political office, was describing me in say 2012 as a potential nightmare. By 2022, it had grown in such confidence and power that it was able to cancel shows in four different countries for me, or at least have a role in the cancelling of those shows, in my belief. You know, I had a show cancelled in Lebanon that officially would not be put down to Israel, but I believe that this was a, you know, German government-funded venue that cancels me because I'm an employee of Mint Press. But I think that what really happened was there was... You know, particularly the German government in the Middle East serves as a precursor or as a facilitator of normalization with Israel. And so I believe that on some level there was there was involvement there in the cancelling of that show. But whatever the case may be, we're talking about over 10 shows were cancelled, events, talks, um, Really, I can't expect now to, in a very unproblematic way, ever do any type of work in a school, for example. And that's because uh, they will be able to manufacture a uh, a campaign against me. I had a, a show cancelled in Leeds in 2023, if I remember correctly as well. Um, and, and regularly, regularly there will be um, abuse targeted at events uh, at venues that try to host me. They'll be threatened with legal action. Um, but none of this is exceptional. It, it's happened many times to many people. Um, and the lobby is, like I said, through the Corbyn years, it was able to really um, oil its wheels and build up its system, its systems of cancelling people. And so I would say that they, with the attempt to uh, push me off of Spotify, it was an overreach, which um, was really off the back of cancelling an appearance of mine at the National Union of Students. So within a few months, I was cancelled. The trade unions are a no-go for me, and this shows the power of the Israel lobby. But it also, I would say... Um, escalated and climaxed with the cancelling of me from major left-wing organizations also in this country um and it's not by coincidence that the left-wing organizations cancelled me at the same time the israel lobby cancelled me before the israel lobby were actively cancelling me the left didn't have a problem with me but then as soon as the israel lobby 
intensified their campaign against me. It's then the left wing groups decided they had a problem with me and cancelled me from the the major left wing platforms in this country. I have more of a presence in Belgium or in the Netherlands, the left in the Netherlands, than I do in the left in this country now at this stage. Because ultimately, through the development of Palestine Action, we have created a new, a new movement and a new culture which has not been absorbed into the existing systems of, of political expression really in this country. But in terms of the Spotify campaign, it was led by an organization called We Believe in Israel, which was headed at the time by Luke Akehurst, who was on the NEC of the Labour Party. This is a key decision-making body for the Labour Party. Um, we Believe in Israel is a, a clear proxy of the Israeli embassy, and it was attempting to bully Spotify into chasing me off because it had seen I'd been cancelled from the NUS platform, which is National Union of Students. I'd then been cancelled from the Toll Puddle Martyrs Festival, which is amazing because the Toll Puddle Martyrs Festival is based on the first trade union grouping in this country who were expelled to Australia, to a penal colony in Australia because they wanted to do uh, collective bargaining in the society in Dorset. And so the whole festival was about the cancelling of these people. And it's run by the Trade Unions Congress. So that's all trade unions put together. And then they come and cancel me on the basis that these Zionist groups are mobilising against me. Um, and so I think the Spotify campaign came because they felt that they did now was the time to maximize what they were trying to do. And they wanted to cut off my ability to live and earn. And so they looked at where I was earning. They're like, okay, Spotify, let's get him off Spotify. But what they didn't bank on was two things. Number one, they did not bank on the existing goodwill that had been built up through over a decade or two decades of work at that time. Um, but more than that, they did not um, correctly estimate the amount of um, resentment that exists for these type of witch hunt tactics. And so as soon as people are hearing that the Israel lobby is trying to get you off Spotify, they so people that I had never met before, um, you know, really very powerful people, actually. You know, you had you had um, Mark Ruffalo, Hollywood actor. You had a, a, a princess of Jordan. You had a UN special rapporteur. These are people I'd never spoken to. I didn't contact them. They got involved in the campaign to stop the lobby from removing the music from Spotify. Um, but, you know, most importantly, it was people like um, Mint Press, people like Alan McLeod and people like Asa Winstanley from Electronic Intifada that from the beginning, from the beginning, were working on the wording of the document that would go out to all these people to seek their support. It was uh, Saud Khalaf who was working with me at the time, who worked very hard to try and push that campaign as hard as possible. The, these were the ways in which we defended ourselves but it was never used in the Corbyn era, unfortunately. There was no point that Corbyn turned around and said, in black and white, the Israel lobby is trying to interfere in our democratic system. Had he done that, he yes, he wouldn't be prime minister, and yes, he would still be kicked out of the Labour Party, but you would have had a greater education in the society about what the Israel lobby is. You'd be closer to reality in terms of people's understanding of what was happening. Um, and, you know, listen, Spotify is nothing like leading a major political party. So I'm in no position to necessarily lecture him on what he should or shouldn't have done. However, I do think there is space within looking at how that process played out because we won the PR war decisively, decisively, and they backed off. Um, they didn't back off from cancelling shows completely but they generally backed off from cancelling shows and from publicly advocating for silencing me on Spotify. So 
ultimately we beat them. It was a victory. Um, other venues did get, interestingly, after the Spotify campaign, when venues would get pressure to cancel me, they were far more empowered to push back and say no. Whereas before the Spotify campaign, they were rolling like dominoes. Um, wow. So, you know, th there's a lesson in that. And the ultimate lesson is um, if you don't fight back, you won't win. If you do fight back, you might win. And, and, and so therefore, you can't backpedal. You can't apologize. You can't act as if this is a good faith intervention because as soon as you do that, you've lost already. And, you know, they, they, they're great in number. The people that backpedaled and tried to apologize their way out of these confected um, controversies always, always lose. We were wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong. Corbynism was more than a living organism Centred on one man, the vehicle of a broader mission The main focus was how they could reform the system Millions of people up and down the country saw the vision As a chance for you to improve your conditions What we learn is the establishment is more malignant Constant attacks to drag supporters from the core positions A story of betrayal, backstabbing and sore decisions Millions with dreams, the establishment killed them Operation Clockwork Orange parallels with Harold Wilson the fact you have to feel then Cut the flowers, can't stop the spring But why wilt like daffodils then Ten down the street, a closed door with a frozen heart The end of a long, broken path Where Cobra's guard closed with Absolutely, and I think, you know The way in which the Israel lobby likes to, to work to attack people It's psychological warfare, you know They want to yeah. attack you in all of these ways To smear you, to blacklist you To isolate you, to target your bank account to make you feel like you're all alone but the truth is is that you know you're not alone and the people who get targeted are not alone and the more we speak up and fight back uh, we realize how much support we truly have and i think the israel lobby and israel in general has really shot itself in the foot with silencing its critics because you know the mass population you know the human race <laughs> People in general, humanity has united across all political fronts and religious lines, sectarian lines to stand in solidarity with Palestine. And they're aware that the enemy is um, Israel and the Israel lobby. And so um, it's really beautiful to see how much support that you had received and the awareness that we brought um, all of us together to what the Israel lobby was doing. But this is just, you know, one example. The Israel lobby for a very long time has attempted to infiltrate so many different facets of society, including the entertainment industry. And what you described with what's happening in Spotify is really just one example. Um, could you speak a little bit more about how the Israel lobby has infiltrated um, and been able to sway the entertainment industry? Well, it's an interesting question, um, and the history of this uh, needs to be traced. But really, what you find is a way that implicitly artists will self-censor in order to avoid any type of blacklisting that could happen. So I've looked at someone like DJ Khalid, for example, and I've questioned, you know, what can possibly be happening in his psyche which keeps him silent on what is happening because he is a Palestinian person. He will have family members. They will be suffering. He will be affected by what he's seeing on a human level. But when you look at the associations that he has through Universal Music Group, for example, the current director of Universal Music Group is Haim Saban. Now, Haim Saban is the largest fundraiser for the Friends of the IDF in the history of the organization. He's someone who's been credited as writing Biden's script on Israel. He's an Israel lobbyist. He's a former Israeli soldier. Now, for him to have such a position at the largest music company in the world, you do have to question what that means in terms of political expression on the label. Have you seen Universal? You know, Universal historically has published some of the more subversive art. So you'd have uh, Bob Marley release his music through Universal, the precursor to Universal. 
Um, but also you've had other artists that have made Linton Quasey Johnson, for example, through Island Records, a subsidiary of Universal, um, uh, writing about the killing of Blair Peach, who was a teacher killed by uh, the police at an anti-fascist dem demonstration in Southall in London. Um, so they've got a history of publishing some quite challenging political works. However, when it comes to Palestine, none of that is there. Um, so then you have to wonder what's actually going on at the highest level of the company. And of course, you do have, um, as the CEO of Universal Music Group, Lucien Grange. Now, Lucien Grange has been pictured at a fundraiser for the Friends of the IDF, which I believe was organized by Haim Saban. He's also somebody who's married into the uh, Lewis family, which is uh, the family that owned the River Island uh, shop, which was well known for supporting Zionist causes. Um, Caroline Grange, um, his wife from the Lewis family, Caroline Lewis, um, is on the board of a family foundation which pumps funds into pro-Israel uh, lobby groups like the Zionist Federation, like the Henry Jackson Society. So there's an existing relationship there that can be traced um, that you do have to wonder how is that affecting the kind of music they're willing to put out? How many? I mean, now it's changing because they're viewing the Middle East as a uh a population to exploit a consumer base to exploit but they weren't signing any remotely arab artists for decades and people like myself or mike righteous who's from middle east middle eastern origin these were artists who were obtaining millions of views through youtube so surely that was monetizable for major labels they could have potentially signed artists like us and made money, but they they didn't do that because there is an ideological uh, basis to what they do. You know, the story is not that different at Warner Music, for example. You have high-ranking figures within Warner who have strong um, Zionist backgrounds. So, you know, you do have to wonder. You look at Lupe Fiasco, for example, who was signed to Atlantic, which is a subsidiary of Warner, and the album that he put out, put out when he said that Gaza Strip was getting bombed, Obama didn't say anything, um, was the last album he put out for Warner Music. And as far as I understand, the last album that he put out on a major label. So the mechanisms, you know, and the head of uh, uh, Atlantic at that time was Leo Cohen, um, who's now gone, gone on to head music at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at YouTube. And of course, Leo Cohen is somebody with, um, you know, an Israeli background who had a father that fought in 1948 as part of the Zionist terror groups, whose mother used to work for Abba Iban, the Israeli um, ambassador at the United Nations, um, and who started his career working for uh, the National Israeli Bank. Um, and he's somebody that has, from time to time, intervened with letters that are basically supportive of Israel's policy. Like in 2014, he put his name to a letter. It was published. It was credited to him as the author, whether he did or didn't author it, I'm not sure. Um, basically trying to calm down anti-Israel feeling around its war in Gaza in 2014. Um, so th these are not politically neutral people when it comes to them being active at the top of the music industry. It's just a simple fact. If somebody with my kind of political orientation was to be at the top of a, a music uh, company, it's going to inform the kind of music that I will lend my support to. And these are, you know, they say that something like 99% of the music that exists in the world today is owned by one of the big three, which is Warner, Universal, and Sony. So it, it, the, the whole industry is is based on the monopolizing of uh, expression, of creative expression. Intifada. 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 Once 
Once upon a time in the little Middle East There was a fascist settler entity on a killing spree They pillaged the innocent villagers to steal their dignity It's simple, this literal misery's a thrill to industry In case you're wondering, the place is Philistine From little Italy to Greece and the streets of the Philippines They know the name, even Algeria felt the guillotine Cause ignorant idiots sit and wish to bring them to their knees When it's like that, they even kill children holding white flags It's quite mad, clear the only choice is to fight back No, we are not scared no, you cannot kill us. Resistance forever on behalf of those not with us. And it's really amazing to hear music that isn't bad. <laughs> From awful pro-Trump country music to the cringe-inducing raps in the musical Hamilton, it seems like a lot of political music today is very tone deaf. You talked a little bit about that. Um, could it be that it's that the music industry is controlled by those three uh, companies that you mentioned? I mean, what do you think accounts for that? And why isn't music in the style of yours more popular? Well, I think the gatekeepers who are able to control the algorithms, who are able to control the airwaves. When I first started making music, if you were not played on the radio, then your music didn't really exist. And so at that time, the people that were forming the playlists of the radio would control what was and wasn't cool and what was and wasn't even heard. Now, in the situation we're in now, you have a lot more freedom and ability to reach people than you did back in those days. Because if you weren't on the radio, all you had was the open mics. And that's what that's how I started. I got my start. I used to call in the radio as a 16-year-old and a 15-year-old and rap on the shows when they used to open up the lines for people to rap. Um, there was a show There was a show called Friday Night Flavors um, hosted by a DJ called uh, DJ279 on Choice FM, which is London's, was London's first FM uh, wavelength black radio station. Um, and on Friday nights, they used to play hip hop. And so I call in and rap as part of a competition in order to then get on there. Um, and then I got on something called Knights of the Round Table on the radio station. I got to go in and rap. This is a teenager. And then the open mics were a really um, strong place for me. I used to go every single week to the open mic in central London. I used to battle people, um, battled for my name um, because there was somebody else there called Low Key. And then really off the back of that is how I would then get the CDs, produce the CDs and sell them. And then there were a few magazines. So there was a magazine called Hip Hop Connection, which then would review the album. And that was the scene at the time. There, there wasn't anything else. There, the internet didn't exist. It didn't exist. Then the internet comes around and you're able to reach people through MySpace and then Facebook and then YouTube. And it all, it all starts changing, really. Um, but I think the reason why uh, political music is not considered more popular is simply because if you even look at the budgets that are attached to these artists um, on the major labels who are remotely political, their budgets are far, far, far smaller than the budgets that are afforded to the rappers who are rapping about um, really a form of social suicide. They're rapping about uh, fraternal violence. They're rapping about um, hurting others in their community. Whereas those that are attempting to uplift their communities, that are attempting to speak against the established status quo and the stratification of society, will not receive the same type of support from those, uh, those machines. So ultimately, you find yourself in a position when, where you are trying to push back against this. And of course, with the genocide in Gaza now, those lines have become more clearer than ever before. As you will know, um, trying to make the arguments we make was actually a lot harder prior to October 7th and the war that followed it. We were far more marginalized, whereas now our ideas are basically mainstream. The majority of the population in both the country you live in, the country I live in, actually agree with our point of view. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. 2022, 2020, 2023, we were a smaller 
but still powerful um, group of people. I think now, ultimately, we're a force to be reckoned with. This period of time has had Mint Press, Declassified UK, Electronic Intifada, The Grey Zone, all of us beat mainstream media in terms of our shaping of public opinion being more successful than them. We're talking about the legacy media, the mainstream corporate media has not been able to inculcate people with its ideas into the same success that we've been able to. That's with all the shadow banning, that's with all the rest of it, we've been able to reach millions of people throughout this period of time um, who who have, uh, have, have found these ideas to be resonant with them. And this is this is a major change. It's a major shift, actually. In some ways, this war um, also marks the end of traditional media having control on public opinion um, in the way that it did before. Trust has fallen even further than it was during COVID in the mainstream media due to the way that it's depicting the war in Gaza. Can't get the image out of my heart When we've seen the bodies found in a mountain of parts Netanyahu told you just another child of the dark Clear it's gonna take much more than thousands to march More than a speech, more than a poem More than a track of music Gonna take more than a sit down with Basim Yusuf Even bringing back ambassadors is an act that's useless As long as you pump oil for Apaches and the tanks they're using Freedom just beyond reach for people you cannot see He's wheezing and cannot breathe And screaming through the concrete Looking for his fortune children the bombs leave structures absolutely and you know israel as i've said time and time again has really shot itself in the foot because people are able to see through the propaganda and it's because of independent outlets and independent voices like yourself um, who have been able to pop the propaganda bubbles and really shape the narrative about what's really happening um, in gaza but also to expose israel's tentacles, I guess you could say, in which they have embedded themselves and infiltrated so many assets of um, society, but especially in the high tech industry to spy on people. And, you know, I got a little bit of a, a sneak peek of your song Friend or Foe, uh, which deals with how smartphones are not necessarily our friends. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Israel's global, global spying network? Um, yeah, global, Israel's global spying network. Go ahead. Well, throughout the period following the Oslo Accords, this led to a, a great flow of information into Unit 8200. Now, Unit 8200 is the Israeli military's um, signals communications um, department. It's the equivalent of GCHQ in this country. And what it does is it processes and analyzes um, communications of Palestinians and others in other parts of the world uh, through their electronic devices. Now, um, in, the, in the situation we're in now, we are now living through the consequences of a 2012 policy that Benjamin Netanyahu set into motion, whereby they moved individuals from Unit 8200 into private companies. And so this ability of Israel to insinuate itself not only into the information infrastructure of the world and the intelligence agencies of other countries, but also um, <clears throat> to insert itself into the supply chain, which is what you saw with the pager attack in Lebanon. All of these have consequences that are, in some cases, deadly. What you also saw over these years is the build-up of Unit 9900, which is Israel's a visual intelligence uh, unit, which has satellites um, above the sky. So even in cases where Israel does not enter the airspace of another country, it will have satellites above the country that can communicate what is happening on the ground there. And so they are believed, for instance, to have had a role, this unit, in the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah. Um, but the song, particularly Friend or Foe, 
speaks about the the mobile phone, the smartphone, as basically smart as an acronym for surveillance um, marketed as revolutionary technology, whereby if you in your house have Alexa, you have to be aware that it's not going to stop listening to you. And so, for example, there are those that have spoken about this is the first time in history that a book can read a person, meaning that while you're online reading a book, everything about the way you behave is being um, not only monitored, but then noted by the machine. And then through AI is being used to work out and deduce certain things about how you are. So they have 5,000 character points built off of your behavior with your smartphone. That's a significant change. And that gives an, a really significant informational advantage to whoever has that data. And Israel has set about since 2012 um, obtaining as much data as it can about as many people as possible. And it's doing that through uh, an encouragement of quote unquote entrepreneurship by former employees of Unit 8200. But in the case of that song, friend or foe, it's actually just more generally about this position that the phone has in our life. And I often would look at it and I'd think, how is it <clears throat> that these Palestinian resistance fighters in some cases, you know, you look at the case of Odei Tamimi, who carried out um, an operation um, at the checkpoint next to Sharafat camp, where he um, killed um, at least one Israeli soldier, I think more than one Israeli soldier, but then he disappeared for 13 days. Now, the reason that he was not found for those 13 days is because he did not use, he did not have a phone with him and he disappeared within the community and shaved his head and that led to others in the community shaving their heads so it could confuse Israeli soldiers he was only eventually found and killed when he went to a settlement to launch an operation and it was then he was killed then you look at say for example the assassination of somebody like Ismail Hani so the, the story is whether it's true or not he had a smartphone with him that had WhatsApp downloaded onto it, and he was in family group talking to people. And one would wonder why, why this was the case. It's not that we're addicted to the phone as people. We're addicted to the connection with others, and we seek connection. And so the phone is doing so many things at the same time. It's, it's exploiting your need to be closer to other people in order to deduce information about you that you just don't know is being gathered about you. And so you don't know what this system has in terms of data about you and then what that data has been used to deduce about who you are, what you think like, what you want, what you aspire for, what are your ambitions, what are your fears, what are your weaknesses. What are your vulnerabilities? What are your patterns of thought, of behavior, of movement? All of that can be obtained by looking at the smartphone that you have with you, including listening to you right now, including seeing your child's face. You may not put pictures of your children on the internet, but if they use your smartphone, then the pictures exist somewhere. And that's, you know, I, 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 uh, allude to Edward Snowden on the song and for instance in Permanent Record he talks about um, working for Booz Allen Hamilton as a contractor for US uh, security agencies and he says we found commonalities between all people <clears throat> that all people would take pictures of their children all people would have all manner of details personal private details he said which are not in any way private they are part of a permanent record which actually the highest bidder can have access to wow. so that's 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 quite that's quite incredible change in human civilization but also think about it this way anything that we use say eight hours a day would normally be seen as a form of drug addiction right 
if you were to smoke for eight hours a day, if you were to drink for eight hours a day, or, or something else, it would be seen as something discouraged societally, possibly. I mean, in smoking and drinking, maybe not so much. But with the phone, all of us are addicted to the phone. We've all been hooked onto this technology without fully understanding the exchange that is taking place. The phone is one thing to us, but then a completely different thing to the people on the other side of that information. Um, and Israel has been able to position itself on the other side of that information very skillfully and through the develop development of Unit 8200. And, and that's, I would say, part of the story of this war too. While you've seen the, the media become, uh, the mainstream media become rendered more and more at odds with truth, you've also seen, I would say, play out on the ground. You look at, for instance, the 2006 war in Lebanon, Hezbollah was able to defeat Israel with only 3,000 fighters. With only 3,000 fighters in 2006. What's changed since 2006? Israel has a massive informational advantage because of their monitoring of communications um, in a way that's just unprecedented. Um, and so all of these things, I think, are worthy of study. And I think the album deals with that a bit. And the friend or foe song, um, it might surprise some people because they think I'm talking about a friend for the first two verses. And then in the last verse, you understand that I'm actually talking about the phone. And it's that position that the phone has in our in our life, which is, um, I would say, pretty unnatural, actually. Born in Congo, raised in China, but he says he's American. My best friend cares about people over anything. A strange day, late teens, first time I met with him. So knowledgeable, felt like this guy knew everything. We chat through his windows before we came out with me. Even saw him teaching all the younger kids how to read. We both love fruits, but apples were his thing. Sometimes he doze off, I just tap him on the chin. In the beginning, he taught me how to deal with snakes. Later, help with my career and how to build a base. He knows everyone, always seen white. Beyond his years, I open up to him face to face, cried a lot of tears. Where we went wrong, I'm not sure. It's hard to explain. I would definitely agree. Um, apart from all of those dopamine hits and trying to achieve connection, which is literally how people get addicted to drugs, it also uh, feeds people's egos. And so it keeps everybody coming back over and over again. Um, Loki, we are so excited for your album to be released, soundtrack, soundtrack to The Struggle 3. I think it will, um, you know, be a light right now, something to inspire us all to take, to, you know, to create change, to take action in these really, really dark times. Um, and so we thank you and we commend you for standing up to the Israel lobby, uh, for pushing back. And, you know, we're honored to work with you and to continue to stand in your corner. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manoff. I appreciate it.